All right. On September 17th, 1787, a lady named Elizabeth Willing Powell had a question. She asked this specific question. She said this, well, doctor, what have we got? Have we got a republic or have we got a monarchy? The answer from Benjamin Franklin was this, a republic if you can keep it. A republic if you can keep it. You know, our fledgling nation was given that day something that is dear, something that we still hold today. And also, with that statement, so they were given something, but also with that statement, a challenge was given to us as well. It was a gift that they were to fight for and faithfully protect. You understand this in America. What were we given? Were we given a democracy or were we, were we given a republic? We were given a republic. Do you understand this gift? The word republic means a state in which supreme power is held by the people. All right? That's from the Oxford languages. If you don't understand republic democracy, it's a state in which supreme power is held by the people. It's invested in our representatives through the people. You know what this is called? This is called liberty. This is called freedom. The Declaration of Independence says this, we have unalienable rights of which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We may forget how wonderful this is, but let's go back just four years ago during COVID, we saw for the first time some of our gifts assaulted. Again, if, the, if it truly was a pandemic where the loss of, where massive loss of life, you know what? It was proper to not meet. But some of our gifts were assaulted under the, a false attack. Our church services, in person at least, were suspended. They were suspended. There was talk about limiting our movements, possibly from state to state. Do you realize, and so many of us have been used to this freedom that we've been given. We may not understand all of our freedoms, but do you understand that you have the right to be in all 50 states at any time? Okay? During that time, there was talk of suspending our rights to move from state to state. When 99.97% of people survive this. Again, I'm not minimizing the loss of life. I'm not minimizing it. I don't make light of that. We were very careful when we started because of the elderly, because of all, we didn't know how to handle this. I'm simply talking to you today about freedom. All right? Do you realize the freedom you have? The First Amendment in the Bill of Rights tells us that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. I don't know if you remember, but strip clubs were able to be open during that time, but not churches. Um, I hope you understand the difference, why one was allowed and one was not. It's a purposeful attack against our, our faith. Obviously, we made it through that. But the First Amendment says we shouldn't be prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. You, you'll see it all over. They're saying, you can't say that. You can't say this. That's not America. Now, there are certain things we should not say. We should have grace. We should have truth. But the right to speak should not be taken away from us. Or the right of the people peaceably to assemble. Now, I want you to understand this, and I know you do. It's a reminder. Our founding fathers weren't granting us these blessings from their wise benevolence. And blessings they surely are. I hope you stop and think sometime. You can believe what you want. You can say what you want. You have a 100% right to believe as your conscience dictates. And that's a great freedom. But the founding fathers didn't grant us those freedoms. Do you know why? Because they didn't come from our founding fathers. They came from God. Okay? But the founding fathers, they were wise. And they simply laid them out as a foundation for a free people. No tyranny would, place the, would be placed upon our minds or our bodies. But also, Franklin gave a solemn warning. So he said, he said, we've given you a republic, but the solemn warning was, see if you can keep it. Franklin said, if you can keep it. You know, that day the thought was delivered to us as a people that these blessings would necessitate vigilance to protect them. Vigilance to protect them. There will be those who will attempt to steal your liberties from you and bring you back under control. Can you see that in our country? Mm -hmm. The very freedoms that we've been given, there are folks that want to steal those, and the reason they want to steal those is they want to bring you under their control. It's very clear. They, there are those who will attempt to steal these liberties, 
Now, spiritually speaking, there are greater liberties that we must protect that have eternal costs. What I want to, so we're in a series, and we'll, I'll, I'll tell it to you again, but we're starting a new series until we go back into a book, but I'll give you the title in a moment, but um, spiritually speaking, there are greater liberties that we must protect that have eternal costs. If we don't protect the liberties that we've been given spiritually, the next generations will fall and miss these spiritual liberties potentially. But if we protect them, it will help to protect our national freedoms too. Everything rises and falls upon God. There's a reason America is the way it is. It was founded on biblical principles and principles of freedom, complete freedom, religiously, in every way. Okay, so uh, we need to have vigilance spiritually as well. I want to say this. To guard our national freedoms, we have to make priorities. Watch this. Our pleasures cannot always reign. Our pleasures cannot always reign. For while we indulge in pleasures, while we aren't paying attention, there will be those making it their priority to erode our freedoms to gain control over us. Literally in the United States, we are indulging in all sorts of pleasure, but there's people that are serious about priorities to take away our liberties. I mean, there's things that we're, that we're talking about that would never have been in the mind of our people of our country 50 years ago, 100 years ago. But there's people that are making it their priority to erode these things. And you know what America is doing? We're indulging in pleasure. We're, we're just enjoying life. You know what? I've said it many times. John 10, the Bible says that God gave us life and he wants us to enjoy abundantly. He wants you to enjoy the scenery, the family, the people, the things that you can do in this world. But never are we supposed to indulge to the point where we're not vigilant over our liberties. So, while we're, pay, while we're not paying attention, their priority. So, while we're goofing off as a nation, as a people, there's people that are diligent to try to attack some of these things. How many politicians today do you think would like to remove some of the parameters of the Constitution? You think they're out there? Absolutely. Our Second Amendment right? First Amendment rights being attacked all the time. Freedom to assemble, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. They're attacking that, saying, you can't say that. You have to hire this people and this people. You can't. It's, it's being attacked. The Second Amendment, the right to protect ourselves, is being attacked constantly. So all of these, there's people out there, and it's their priority. There's whole groups, their whole priority is to disarm us. You've heard me rant on that. I don't want to rant on that. Uh, the, the one thing I rant about they say that they care about the children, but the very schools, they won't arm. They won't arm the schools, okay? And they're quick to take away the lives of the unborn, and they cry to us, if you guys would get rid of the guns, less people would be killed. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, there's some people that, have, that knew this was going to happen. Our founding fathers knew, because they lived in state-controlled countries. Mm -hmm. They knew this. They had the chance to start all over. It's just like us. We get the chance to start all over in Christianity. But they got the chance to start all over, so they said, we're going to do this right. If you know anything about the Founding Fathers and the conventions, they argued a lot. They debated, but they came together to find out the way that they could give us the best freedom, and they did. There's no For all the criticisms of America, and many of them are true and valid and just, for all of those, people still are, I mean, are people flooding over the borders because we're a horrible country? No, that's not what's happening. So, anyways, it's the same in the Christian life. So there's those that are making it their priority to erode our freedoms. If the evil one has priorities and he has his minions working tirelessly, should we not have priorities as a Christian to protect our liberties? It's the same thing. If we don't protect our Christian liberties, are going to be lost. So it's the same in the Christian life. God, think of this, and I'll just hit a few of them. God has given us incredible liberties. If you truly know Jesus Christ and you felt the weight of sin... And then one day you stepped up off your knees or however it was when you turned to Christ and you realized my sins are gone, never to be told to me again. Never to, I'm never going to be um, held responsible for my sins again. And I don't mean we can live irresponsibly. I mean the guilt, the weight that has been on us was taken away by Jesus Christ. We are purged from our sins. We have incredible liberty. We have freedom from sin. We have a home purchased for us in heaven. John chapter 14, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. We have a place in heaven. I asked the Lord Jesus to save me, so now I have a building, a mansion of my own. got my name on it. I have a new name probably in heaven. I don't know which name is on there, but I'll tell you this. 
He did that for me. I'm going to make my life a priority to live for Him. Freedom from sin, a home purchase in heaven, eternal life, never to die. All of us, we, we wake up. I don't know how you do, but I wake up and, and, and during different times of the day, I think something could happen to me. I could die. I could live till 90. I could live till 100. I could live till 60. I don't know. But we have a promise of eternal life that will never stop. What blessings we have. We have the ability not to be brought into bondage again to our, to our former master. If you struggled with an addiction and God delivered you, what a blessing it is. You're in Christ. He's given you the ability through the Holy Spirit to overcome those things. The ability to be free to serve him. We can do anything in this country and serve in any fashion we want. We're free as a bird. Have you ever tried to imagine, like maybe you had a bird in a cage and you let it go? Can you ever, did you ever imagine what that would be like? That's what we have. But as believers, we must prioritize our lives because there are those that want to bring us back into bondage. That would be Satan and all the things he uses to attempt to do this. Here's our series. Protecting our liberties by priorities. Just as we have to be vigilant to protect the freedoms we've been given, there's people that lobby continually to try to fight, and things have been changed by people lobbying. We can't just live comfortably. But just as we protect our nation, we must protect our Christianity. Our title today is Liberty and How We Keep It. Really simple out of these verses. Liberty and how we keep it. We'll see what we are to do to keep it, and also we will see two things that will hurt our liberty or hinder our liberty. So we'll find out how to have liberty or how to keep our liberty and then how to and the two things that will possibly hinder it. As Americans we are to be watchful. Our enemies are now not on the outside. The enemies of the United States of America are on the inside of our country. Okay? Promise you, promise you. There are outside too, but they're inside. You think of China, they own this has been the in thing to talk about TikTok. TikTok, 170 million users, owned by the Chinese. The Americans are worried that this is a, a key element of where they can spy on us. And I talked to you a week or two ago about the Herkle Durkle. That's people who lay in bed all day. That's, it's the new trend on TikTok, the Herkle Durkle, to stay in bed for multiple hours a day. Are we not a prime, are we not in a prime situation to lose our liberties? Benjamin Franklin, we've delivered you a republic if you can keep it. We're in danger because we're comfortable. And that's not all the young people's fault. It's maybe our fault, the middle age and the older age, not doing what Psalm 78 says. Tell the next generation the wondrous works of God. If you find a relationship with God and you're right with God and you walk with him and you know what you've been delivered from, you know what you're going to do? You're going to live it. And you're going to try to help the next generation grab a hold of that. Not only for their eternal destiny, but for their future here on earth and for their offspring. So as Americans, we need to be watchful. We're being betrayed from within, right before our very eyes. It happened as a nation, it's happening as a nation because we've lived in pleasure. And the enemy has worked tirelessly while we've enjoyed all sorts of vices, some innocent, some very immoral. There's literal websites on how you can find a way to cheat on your spouse. You can meet different married people so you can cheat on your spouse. Why do you think we're in the wreck we're in? Children are seeing stuff. Predators going after young people on TikTok and Facebook and Instagram. We're being betrayed from within. But it's happening as a nation because we've lived in pleasure. And the enemies work tirelessly while we're enjoying all sorts of vices. It's no different for the believer. Let's look at verse 1. And surprisingly, after I was studying this, I found this connection. Literally what Abraham, I'm sorry, what Benjamin Franklin said to Elizabeth Powell, it's very surprisingly, strikingly like Galatians 5 and verse 1. You'll see it. The interchange that Elizabeth Willing Powell had with Benjamin Franklin is very similar. Look at verse 1. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You, I hope you can see Benjamin Franklin's statement. We've delivered you a republic. What is a republic? It's a nation of the people, by the people, for the people. It's freedom. It's liberty. And then he said, see if you can keep it. This one says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The first phrase declares what Christ accomplished for us. As Benjamin Franklin said, we've delivered you a republic. Freedom. Watch what Christ did. 
Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. When you understood the weight of sin, you understood the magnitude of what Jesus did, and you fell in love with that Savior, and you turned from all this to serve that and Him, that's freedom. It's true freedom. I can tell you, I was like a bird out of a cage when I finally knew for sure. I knew that I knew that I knew that I was saved. It was joy and elation in my soul because I felt the weight of sin was gone. Remember the song? Gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. They're underneath the precious blood of Christ at last, buried in the deepest sea. Yes, that's good enough for me. Praise God, my sins are gone. So, so again, looking at verse 1, Christ has made us free, watch this, by attacking sin and destroying sin. When Jesus Christ went to the cross, he was manifested to destroy the works of Satan. Satan wanted us dead and in hell and destroyed and corrupted by sin. Jesus came to earth to literally attack sin and destroy sin. 1 Corinthians 15, we know that those in Christ, death has no more dominion, death has lost its sin, Sting and death has lost its final say in our lives. That's what Christ has done for us. So he destroyed sin, giving us eternal hope. Watch this. By placing himself as sin and for sin, taking the wrath of God on sin in his body. So he literally took the wrath of God upon him, the forsaking of God. He literally took the wrath of God. He took the, the weight of sin upon himself in his body, dying being buried, and rising again victoriously over sin, death, and hell. Jesus Christ has delivered us from everything that is going to kill us and attack us. Think of it. Sin goes into our life, causing myriad problems in our lives. Death is something we all fear. We're all going to have to face one day, minus the rapture. But then eternal death has all been taken care of by Christ. There's no other Savior I want to serve. I don't want to serve myself. Sometimes I do, right? But I don't want to serve myself after he's done that for me. So he's definitely made us free. But then the second phrase is similar to Franklin's. If you can keep it was his challenge. And we're not doing so good with the Republic, are we? I mean, we're holding on. We're holding on because those, those laws were written into the fabric and the fibers of our country. We're, the, the founding principles that they found from Blackstone and different people that studied scripture... The founding principles are so powerful in our nation that the liberals still cannot upend them. But they're trying. And with the young people that don't, with many young people that don't care and they're living in pleasure, that's how they're going to take them from us. That's exactly how communism works. You give people, give people, give people, give them everything they need, and then they're not going to care. They're going to live in pleasure. And then what do they do? They yank it up. I don't know any of you, but I have no desire whatsoever ever to live in a communist country. Bread lines, I know they might not be having that now, but there's been time. We may face that in our time, but I'm not looking for that. So his challenge, his challenge was if you can keep it. But God's challenge is this. Look at the second part of that verse, and, and there's a very interesting word, and I hope we will look at this. Um, it says this, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where, where Christ made us free. Watch. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That's like his saying, if you can keep it. We've delivered you a republic. We've delivered you freedom if you can keep it. In other words, you better pay attention. Otherwise, you're going to lose it. Same thing with Christianity. Christ did so much. We have to be careful that we don't get ourselves entangled again with the yoke of bondage. We can and we will be helped as we seek to do our part. So let's see. Number one, something we are to do. We're to keep our liberties. We're to do something with our liberties. In America, we're completely free because of the liberties of our founding fathers and those that fought to help us keep them. But we must protect them by keeping our laws. When we ignore them and live like heathens, we will lose them. America's living by, like heathens. It's, we could go into the details. You read any Christian periodical. There's fights every hand. Brad Dacus, the guy that we support, the lawyer, there's fights everywhere. He wins them because of the, the foundations of the Constitution. But America is rapidly basically saying, take all our freedoms for us, from us. We don't care as long as you just give us pleasure. That's literally what we're saying. They were to, So watch this. Paul told the Galatians they were to stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. They were to plant the flag right in the midst of the liberty they were just given. When you're given liberty, you don't run off 
and, and just live the rest of your life in pleasure, you do have pleasure. That's what freedom brings, great pleasure. You can go on a vacation anywhere you want. You can do this, you can that, you can own a weapon, you can do all these things. You have great freedom. But you're not to forget where those freedoms came from. So they were to plant the flag right in the midst of the liberty they were given. When freedom is given, you put your flag there, you make a stand there, you don't forget about it and dive into hedonism. Does anyone know what hedonism is? I'll read you a definition. Anyone, anyone have a definition? Eat, drink, and be merry. Yeah. Uh, say yours again. Eat, drink, and be merry. Yes. Eat, drink, and be merry. You've heard that. Here's, here's the definition the, 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 the definition from the dictionary, the dictionary that I got. It, it, hedonism is the doctrine that pleasure or happiness is the sole or chief good in life. Okay? That's not what we do as Americans. That's not what we do as believers. There is enough time to defend your country and protect your country and enjoy the things of God. You've got to keep those two together. So that was the sin. Watch this. That was the sin of Sodom. Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 and 50 say, Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of what? Does anyone know? Idleness. Abundance of idleness was in her. They did not strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. They were haughty and committed abominations before God. So the Bible says he took them away. That's what the scripture tells us. So let's see what we must do. So in other words, <laughs> liberty, how to keep it. What do we do to keep liberty? And then we're going to find out what are the hindrances to liberty. What are the priorities Christians should have to protect their liberties? To be able to protect our liberties, we make it a priority to stand by them. To stand means to be stationary. While we enjoy God's blessed liberties, we also are told not only to stand, but to stand fast in these freedoms. This phrase means to firmly remain in the same position. Set, stopped, fixed, immovable. You know, I grew up in New England. I love uh, the area I grew up in, but um, I grew up on a dead end road. Two, uh, eight miles from town on two and a quarter acres, three sides surrounded on reservoir. I showed, I told you this recently, but I, I showed Matt an aerial view of where I live. And you can't even see the houses, it's just woods, okay? That's where I had to grow up. But all around my property were stone walls, the old stone walls. And probably 100 years ago or more, they were all fields. But now they're all trees and wooded. And even since I had grown up, the field behind our house that we used to sled in is a, it's woods now. But all along, there was a block, uh, stone walls, just hand-built with rocks. I could tell you where they are. I could take you there today. Those were very important. So, uh, in New England, there were stone walls all over the place there. They marked off properties. Proverbs 22 and 28 tells us, Remove not the ancient landmarks which thy fathers have set. Okay, that was physical. Hey, don't move somebody's property line. That's how they would steal, actually, at night or when the owner wasn't looking. They would move the, 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 the landmarks in so the guy would lose his property so they could have more of their own property. But there's much, it's much more important as a spiritual uh, situation. Landmarks were property boundaries. Others would try to move the boundaries at night or when the others weren't looking to steal what was his. Listen to Job 24, verses 2 and 3. Some remove the landmarks. They violently take away flocks and feed thereof. They drive away the ass of the fatherless. There was people that would actually, orphan children, they needed the property that their father had left them. They would drive away the ass of the fatherless. They take the widow's ox for a pledge. There was people that would steal from them. They would steal their landmarks, pushing them one way or another to steal their land. They would do that because they were rotten, devilish people. Proverbs 23, verse 10 tells us, We are to remove not the old landmark and enter not into the fields of the fatherless. Watch. For the Redeemer is mighty. He shall plead their cause with thee. God will fight for the fatherless and the widow and for anyone who's being ripped off or stolen from. The liberties that we've been given as a country, we need to fight for. We might have to call a senator. We might have to do, go to the Capitol. We might have to do something. But we have a responsibility to be like our founding fathers and protect and keep what has been given. And it's no different with our Christianity. 
But I want you to remember, for their Redeemer is mighty, he shall plead their cause with thee. Those that are trying to destroy our country, those that are trying to destroy our Christianity, God doesn't take that lightly, and he will fight. We may not see it, but in the end, we'll know it was there. See how important it is to protect these things? There are those who want to take your liberties away in Christ. We have to watch over others' landmarks, too. We want to guard others' lives. There's children that we should be guarding. There's young people. There's all different types of people that we should be guarding. People that can't fight as well as us, such as widows and the fatherless. So number one, to figure out what we're supposed to do, we're to stand and we're to stand fast. And then we have a command by God through his apostle. Next, we are not to be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I love this word entangled. Could you describe to me what entangled, what picture comes to your mind when you think of entangled? Anyone have something? Your hair when you have the convertible top down. What's that? Your hair when you have the convertible top down. Okay, that's that's it. That's true, right? Ladies, if you have the top down, Matt, if you have the top down, uh, you can get your hair all tangled up. But how about, what else do you think about? Thank yarn you. when the cat gets in it. Your yarn? The yarn. Oh, yarn when the cat gets in it. All right, that's good. Anything else? Entangled. What's that? Vines. Vines. If, I, I've told you this recently, too, but there's guys on YouTube, and they get a joke of just filming themselves diving into a bramble bush. Oh. I mean, if you want to see that, who would do that? I don't know. These guys do. They dive into cactuses. Oh. That, that, to me, is entangled. Okay? All right? So, entangled, watch what entangled means. It means twisted together, not easily separated. I think I think of a scene I saw where a wild animal, Heather and I were talking about it. It was an elk or a deer, and it was tied up in barbed wire. And the poor thing. And the more it tried to move, what would happen? Does the animal smart enough to get out of that? God didn't give him that same intelligence, right, as us. But the more they turn and twist, the more... And I watched a... I don't know if it was a farmer hunt or whatever, but he came in with clippers saying gently... Because think about it, the animal gets scared, and then they fight more. Right? And then they get tied up more. I think that's what Paul is trying to say. He's given us this freedom. Let us not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So I remember this animal, and the, the guy had to cut the wire out. And, and then what happened when the animal was free? What do you think? What elation, what freedom do you think the animal showed? The, the horse or whatever, they jump and they leap. And you know what it reminds me of? Acts chapter 3, when Peter, uh, Peter and John went into the temple about the hour of prayer, and they healed the lame man. Does anyone know what the lame man did after? He said, I'm so faithful that I can walk now. I've never walked again. Yeah. <laughs> no, he didn't do that. He leaped, and he praised God. Everywhere, he was leaping and jumping, and he was holding on to these guys. That's the freedom we have in Christ. That's the freedom this animal got when it was unchained or unentangled. I remember also watching a guy. He's way out in the ocean somewhere. And there's a blue whale all wrapped up in netting. And it was around his tail and everything. And this man went through and cut around this huge creature. And I guarantee that animal was happy when it's free. This is the idea of entangled. So it means twisted together, not easily separated. Um, it's something you have to try to get extricated from. But the more this animal moves, the more entrapped it became. Same with us. If we get entangled in bondage, it's going to get worse and worse. I ask you this. Do you enjoy your liberties in America? I do. I enjoy it. After I saw COVID, I realized what could be taken from me. I like the fact that I can jump in a car and drive across the state border. I like to be able to say what I want to say. I like to be able to believe what I want to believe. I like to be able to fight for others whose liberties have been taken away. We need to appreciate the government system we have, but you know what? We're living in pleasure. We don't worry too much about it. Oh, hopefully it'll get better. Hopefully it'll get better. If our country is going to be attacked, our Christianity will be attacked as well. So, do you enjoy your liberties? The word free means not being under restraint. All of you, each person right here, can leave, go to eat where you want. You can decide to go home. You can decide to kick up your feet, not herkle durkle, but you can decide, I'm going to sleep. I'm going to go to bed early. You know what? I don't care. I'm going to go visit my kids. And You've got all this kind of freedom. I hope you appreciate that. Again, liberty means freedom, not confined in body or mind. The word free means not being under restraint. Isn't freedom 
sweet air to breathe in and out. I hope you breathe in freedom, in and out. So, think of liberty. How does this wild animal feel when men free them? They, they're happy, they run, kicking and leaping. What would it be like to walk when you never have? What would it be like leaving prison after years in incarceration? I've never been in jail, thankfully. But I can imagine, if you've been in jail for a long period of time, you can't go down to the corner market and buy a soda. You can't go to a ball game. You can't do any of those things. I hope we appreciate the freedom we have in America and the freedom we have right now in Christ. We should not forsake it. But there are things that can twist us up, that can put us into bondage. Bondage means slavery, captivity, imprisonment. You may be physically free on the outside, but there are things that can put you in spiritual subjection. And corrupt passions can take away the freedom in Christ. Let's say you're in Christ, you've been saved and you know it, but you get involved in pornography, you get involved in anger, you get involved in drugs or alcohol. Are you not in bondage again? Are you not entangled with the things when you were already made free? This is true. The freedom in Christ can be taken away if we're not careful. It may sound like a paradox, but true liberty is actually staying in the boundaries that God has set. To me, that's a paradox. People say, I want to do what I want to do. You have the freedom to do whatever you want to do. But eventually, it could bring you into bondage. But if you keep yourself in the bonds that God has given you, you enjoy freedom and breathing. Like right now, I'm not in jail. Maybe someday I'll be in jail if I tell the truth. Who knows how this world will go. But if I follow the laws of the land, guess what? It's never going to happen. And we ought to be careful even in little laws, you know, like texting and driving. You ever think about that, what could happen if you text and drive? You could be in bondage really quick. I think about this. I try to remind myself because sometimes I don't do so good. Sometimes I look at my phone or I, I'll, I'll voice something, right? But what if you hit someone? What if you take the life of somebody else? Um, or let's say you're drinking. Guess what? You have the freedom to get drunk. You want. I don't think you have the right biblically. I think we're to be sober and upright and godly. But you have the right to get drunk. What happens if you take the life of someone? You think you're going to be free in Christ? You're still free in Christ. You're saved, but... Look at the punishment. Look at the punishment someone else goes through. We have to be careful that we stay in the boundaries. Inside the boundaries is really something that gives us freedom. Boundaries keep you free. If you have, how many have seen the Grand Canyon? Raise your hand. All right. How many of you have run right up to the edge? Why don't you do that? Number one, it's sandstone. Our, our pastor friend, he did that when he moved out to Arizona. We, were, we came a little after. We were like, no, stop. It's not like back east where everything's hard and... They're sandstone. If you run up to the Grand Canyon, you just see its awesome beauty, and you fall thousands of feet, literally you can fall thousands of feet, many have, uh, that freedom instantly is taken away. So, in a split second, you can fall thousands of feet to the death. But there's two areas. So, here's what he tells us to do. Stand fast. We're to, we're to hold our place. Enjoy the freedoms, but with vigilance. Having, you know, like soldiers, they enjoy freedom, but they are vigilant. They watch. So we're to stand fast in the freedom Christ has given us. He's, he's cut away all sin from our life. He's given us the ability to overcome sin. We must be vigilant or we can be tangled back up. Right? So he, that's what he tells us to do. Stand fast. Don't be entangled. Now I want to show you the, the two things that will entangle us. Again, it may sound like a paradox, but freedom is found in keeping boundaries. The first one is false religion. False religion. Look at Verse 2, we're going to go through, quickly we're going to go through the next few verses. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. I hope you see the bondage there. There's nothing wrong with the law. The law is good and holy and righteous. It shows us how much we need Christ. But if your life is wrapped up in keeping the commandments of God, guess what? God says, okay. I testify to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. If you want to live by the law, then God requires you to keep every commandment. Guess what? I'll take my freedom in Christ. It doesn't mean I want to sin. I want to follow the laws of God. And by the grace of God, with his Holy Spirit, I will stay away from the things that entangle me. But I don't want to have to keep all the law. I want to let Christ keep it through me. That's freedom. All right? So... If you do what you do, if you're religious and you do what you do in a rote manner with no love for Christ beating within you, your Christian faith should be beating like this. It should be beating passionately. 
If you, if you will not allow Christ to be within you, Christ will profit you nothing. If you want to live in the bondage of false religion, then you're a debtor. The word debtor means obligated. You're obligated to keep the law. And this is impossible. Verse 4 tells us Christ is of no effect or no consequence unto you. Christ really has no consequence. He has no ability to change your life. Look at verse 4. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are, justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. So a, a, an entanglement for us in our Christian freedom is to try to perform to please God. Or maybe a person's not even saved, and they're trying to perform the word of God to please God. That's bondage. That's entanglement. The more you get entangled up in it, the, more, the worse it's going to get. The more wounded you're going to be. And if you're not saved, you're going to be cast into hell. And then you'll, like last week we learned, Lord, Lord, didn't we do mighty works? Jesus said, I never knew you. Be careful not to be entangled with religion, but to have liberty in Christ. So, false religion. So, uh, it, it's impossible to try to keep the law. All right? Christ gives... So this, you miss out on the advantage Christ gives you for the dead, empty, and powerless works you will try to live. Don't try to live the, the, the faith of God in the flesh. You miss the powerful advantage Christ gives you by Him working in you. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Christ working in you is way more rewarding than anything we can do. If you're trying to please God by how you live, you're going to be sorely disappointed because you did it on your own without the power of God and it's not going to be accepted. But if you yield to God and you surrender to God, then you feel the amazing power of God come in you to change your life. Christ working in you is way more rewarding than anything we can do. And remember, Jesus said, John 15, 5, without me, you can do nothing. But look at our liberty. Now look at verses 5 and 6. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. We can simply wait for it by our repentance and faith that salvation is going to come to us, that eventual self, complete salvation. Verse 6, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well, who did hinder you? That ye should not obey the truth. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. This is Satan's way to entangle us through religion. There's no freedom in that. Freedom comes in Christ. So, working our way is a snare. Verses 7 through 9. We saw that. Paul trusts God will work through and knows the enemy's end. Look at verse 10. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. Uh, the people that promote religion as a life, they're going to be in trouble. They have judgment coming from God. But so first, the first danger to our liberty is false religion. The second danger and the last danger is outright rebellion. Outright rebellion. If you want to find out how to ruin your Christianity, be religious. If you want to find out how to ruin, when I say religious, by the way, there is a good religion. James talks about true religion. Okay? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about works religion for salvation. But the second thing is outright rebellion. The most dangerous thing to liberty is forgetting to stand fast. Forgetting to prioritize things to protect our liberties. Remember, while you're enjoying the freedoms in Christ, while you're enjoying the freedoms in America, you have to stand fast. You have to be vigilant to remember the areas that Satan and the liberals and the haters of America will try to take from us. Look at verse 13 and 14. Well, let me back up. Paul says, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. He says, I wish they were, I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. Now watch verse 13. Here is where the other enemy comes in. We have the enemy of religion. Now we have the enemy of outright rebellion. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. We're called into this liberty, this beautiful freedom, but we're not supposed to use our freedom as an occasion or an opportunity for our flesh to sin. Liberty is not a license or a permit handed out to do what we want. When Jesus saved you, he says, you know what, brother, you know what, sister? It's all gone. It's all done. I don't care how you live. Go fornicate. Do adultery. Do whatever you want. Here's your permit. That's not what the Bible says. We've been given liberty, and so with liberty, we have an awesome and reverent uh, responsibility to do right. Look at verse 15. Here's the start of 
this rebellious, this rebellion to the liberty. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Think about it. When you're tangled up in that wire, the more you fight, the more you get wrapped up. You need somebody to come help you. In our country, breaking all the rules and living lawlessly will definitely put you in bondage, maybe even finding yourself incarcerated. Look at what Paul says there in verse 15. If you bite and devour one another, take heed, watch out, you might be consumed one of another. It might kill you both. Fighting will consume you and the one you're fighting. When you're in turmoil, let me ask you this, are you free? When you're fighting with someone, are you free? I don't know, when I have a disagreement with someone, it bugs me big time. And it takes me a while to get over that. You're not free. You're in bondage. And others around you suffer too. Here's an answer. And I love this. I memorized this as a young man. Galatians 5.16. This I say then. Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Guess what? Have I accomplished that? No, I'm still working on that. I fail so many times. But if I will walk in the spirit, if I will surrender myself to God, I will confess my sin, I will get right with God and ask his spirit to fill me, guess what? The chances are less that I will walk in the flesh. It's, these are um, escape clauses, if you would, or help verses that you have in the Bible. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's a promise of God. You have liberty because when walking in the Spirit, you are doing the things that God loves, and there's no offense to anyone. Your conscience is clear. Watch where the battle is, verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. If you're fighting, you can't do the right things. Now watch. We're going to see the list of rebellious sins. You cannot do the things that you would. The new man's desire is not going to be able to accomplish what he wants because we get enchained by our flesh as a result of being fleshly. As a result of being in the spirit, look at verse 18. But if you are led of the spirit, you are not under the law. You don't have to stress about the law. I remember Lester Roloff, the old time preacher, saying, law doesn't bother a godly man. The speed limit signs don't bother a man who follows the speed limits. Murder doesn't bother a man because he's never going to do that. Adultery doesn't bother that man. It's not a hard law for him because he's committed to his spouse. You're safe when you keep in the boundaries. Think of the entanglements and confusion and the difficulty we would have to extricate ourselves from if we do what's in the next few verses. Boundaries bless us. Don't forget that. Boundaries bless us. Look at verses 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, obviously, saved people, they go to the kingdom of God. But look at these lists of sins. Do you think these lists of sins put you in bondage? They can put you in bondage even if you're saved. If we steal to get what we want, will we get away with it with God? Numbers 32, 23. Be sure your sin will find you out. It will come looking for you. When you sin, guess what? It has a way of finding you. There's people that have done something bad in their life. I remember watching Forensic Files. This one guy got away from murder for like 40 years. Some, somehow they found, using DNA, and this guy in his 80s went to jail for the murder of someone that he did when he was in his 20s. Be sure your sin will find you out. It will come looking for you. People think true freedom means doing what you want. If it feels good, do it. If a man or a woman philanders as a cheater, they have multiple relationships with multiple people. That's not freedom. It destroys homes and it destroys families. And it will destroy you. Here's a promise from the Word of God. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. People don't think when they cheat. The living part of me, the only thing I really have, because this body's going to get old and die, the only thing that I have, the Bible says when you do that, you destroy your own soul. Does that sound like liberty and freedom? Doesn't sound like it to me. Verse 33 says, A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. Have you ever heard of a pastor that committed adultery or a Hollywood person or whatever? That's the first thing I think about when I hear their name or whatever, many times. Because they betrayed their spouse. It, a wound is an injury. It's a dishonor. It's a disgrace. It's a blemish. Reproach means infamy. And it won't be wiped away. 
Doing what feels good, doing things your own way could very well destroy you. How many examples are there of this yet people keep doing it? Over and over again, men cheat and then they get caught and it ruins their family. And then you would think the new generation would say, I'm not doing that, look at that example. They, it just gets repeated over and over and over again. People keep doing it. What about drugs, alcohol? You would think people watch the, the homeless people that are out of their mind because of drug use. You would think they don't do it, but they, they fall. They fall prey to Satan, their enemy. Alcohol. How about lying to get what you want? Anger. All of this brings us back into bondage. The answer is living in the Spirit. Look at verses 20 through 25 and we'll close. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Watch this. Against such, there is no law. There's no law about you being kind. There's no law about you being in control of yourself. There's no law against you being patient with people. There's no law against love. These are fruits. These are liberty. That Things that you will have. You know, for example, in my life, I've chosen, and I have to do it, it's the right thing, but in my heart, I've chosen to be faithful to her. You know what? Every night I go to sleep, I don't have to regret that I have something going on. She knows where I am all the time. I'm transparent with her. You know what that brings? It brings freedom to my life. I can look at my kids with, uh, with integrity. They can look at me with integrity. I can look at my grandkids. Can you imagine if I did that? My kids wouldn't respect me. I probably wouldn't get to see my grandkids for a while, and I would never be the same. Liberty in Christ means you follow the parameters. You follow the parameters. Living in the Spirit, that's the answer. And look at verse 26. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. The best way to freedom is having a priority. In conclusion, a priority for believers is to protect their liberty. This is done by living by the law of liberty. Liberty is doing what's right. If you don't commit adultery, guess what? You have no shame. You, you, you receive trust from your spouse and kids, a priceless thing. I'm telling you right now, I'm not above anything. Like None of us are above anything. But I value the fact that she trusts me. I value the fact that my kids trust me. I don't ever want to lose that. You want to protect the Christian liberty, you live within the bounds of liberty. If you don't steal, guess what? You have a good reputation. If you're honest, you have integrity. You have tons of respect, a good reputation, character. You may not be famous. Who cares? Who cares? But you will have a good name. Proverbs 22, 1 says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor than silver and gold. That's Proverbs 22, 1. I want to say this and I'm done. Putting your flag down deep in the liberty given you will bring peace to, peace to you and it will bring glory to God. We as believers must live this way to please God and affect others. 